Tom, look, if you were getting married, I'd expect to be your best man. Uh, Tom, will you be my maid of honor? <laughs> your maid of honor. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride, right, Richard? I'm Michael Phillips of the Chicago Tribune. Well, I'm Richard Roper. Actually, I'm usually the guy holding up the sign saying, don't do it. <laughs> but that's another movie. Patrick Dempsey has the Tom Hanks, Hugh Grant role, and Michelle Monaghan has the Meg Ryan, Sandra Bullock part in Maid of Honor. Dempsey, who plays, uh, I think it's McMuffin or something on TV, is a handsome guy, but he looks a little grizzled to be playing this 30-ish womanizer named Tom. Michelle Monaghan plays his best friend, Hannah. I'm going to Scotland on business for six weeks. Six weeks? What am I going to do without you? I think you'll be fine. Hello? Hey, how's the weather in England? I'm in Scotland. So it's sunny. It's three in the morning. So it's dark. I'm gonna go back to sleep now. Oh, I hate Scotland. Now these two attractive, smart, likable people are so obviously perfect for each other, yet they're just pals because, well, because we need a movie. Hannah wants Tom to be her maid of honor, so here she fills him in on his fellow bridesmaids. Okay. All right, Stephanie. Stephanie, great. I like and Stephanie. she loves you. Oh, good. And my friend Hillary from camp. Hillary, I don't know Hillary. She's the best. Okay. And Melissa. Oh, no. I had to, Tom. Not She's Melissa. my cousin. No, she hates me. Well, you broke her heart. She broke my nose. That was an accident. She hit me with her fist. Equally phony are the scenes with Tom and his buddies who talk like no group of men I've ever seen or heard. Basic duties is you as the maid of honor. Show Hannah that I'm mature, that I can take care of my responsibilities fully, and that I need to destroy the wedding from within. What happens if you fail at that task? Colin gets her. What are we going to do? Steal the bride. What are we going to do? Steal the bride. What are we going to do? The inevitable resolution is prolonged by an extended trip to Scotland for Hannah's wedding. How about some wacky sequences where Tom tries to outshine the studly Scott? Who knows, maybe we'll even get a scene in a church where crazy declarations are shouted to the world and a punch is thrown. The only thing I liked about this movie is the great Sidney Pollock as Tom's much-married father. I would have rather seen a movie about him instead of this very, very, very tired and familiar love story. After 27 dresses mm -hmm. and this and my best friends, I'm ready for a movie now that's set in divorce court. This is yeah. not This is not good. And well, I be believe, careful what you wish for, yeah, but we'll be talking be, about that in the near future. Right. I believe in recycling, <laughs> but this thing is all spare parts like you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. I mean, this and there's no rooting interest with the Dempsey character. You know, mm -hmm. likable enough actor, I think he's slightly luckier than he is talented, and mm -hmm. I don't know if he can carry a movie yet but you know for me it's like they did not the screenwriters did not deal with how do we get this rich sort of insufferable smug son of a gun in kind of a rooting interest mode well, with the audience you know I you raised a good point well, Michael because I, you know, halfway through the movie I'm thinking I think the Scott I think he's more interesting and yeah, a lot more yeah. fun and yeah the Dempsey character is kind of a kind of a whiner and self-indulgent he doesn't really grow just gliding and I would, through life you know and yeah. that's, no, that's not really much fun to watch. and, and yeah. here's the other thing too you're just waiting it's so fun formulaically laid out. Right. You're waiting for the moment when the Michelle Monaghan character finds out the reason she shouldn't marry the obstacle. Yeah. You well, know? And, that, and that's and when they that. have to do the big whiplash where now all of a sudden he's not a great guy where we find out that there's this hideous family. I would also agree with you about Patrick Dempsey. I think uh, in the uh, the canon of Dempsey the, film yeah, lore the, the oeuvre, yeah. that Can't Buy Me Love remains <laughs> his seminal work. Right. Right. Michelle Monaghan slightly ahead of I him like in her. terms of talent. Yeah. Like and if she got me through the Heartbreak Kid remake alive, she can get me through anything. I yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Our next film is Son of Rambo, a comedy about two English boys remaking their own version of the Sylvester Stallone movie First Blood. It's 1980s. The nice one, Will, is a 10-year-old who's a member of a strict religious sect known as the Brethren, and he falls in with a grim-faced bully, Lee, who lives with the thug of an older brother. Now, Lee shows the sheltered Will a pirated copy of First Blood. From then on, Will, whose father died some time ago, finds his dream life filled with all kinds of strange menace. Here the boys get down to the filmmaking task at hand and the first of several extremely dangerous stunts. Director Garth Jennings has an eye for the outlandish psych egg, and the boys are good, 
but I found the tone of Son of Rambo all over the place, and the mixture of tears and slapstick just all over the place. And you, yeah. Richard, all over the place? <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you all the way on this one, Michael. Uh, a noble effort, but it just kind of falls apart. Way too much stuff going on here, and I guess these two little boys somehow grew up to become Jack Black and Most Deaf and Be Kind Rewind. <laughs> the same kind of spirit where it's like, idea, okay, yeah. they love movies and they're going to do their own version. And then you got this side thing about this, you know, these French foreign exchange students and the kid that's supposedly really cool, but he's not so cool, and yeah. that just seems to be all over the place. And the bully, who's of course really being bullied at home we've seen that before yeah, yeah I, I don't yeah. know I, you know, I, I think you know you're, when you're going too hard for whimsy yeah. and nostalgia then you have like you say these mixed elements it well, just my issue it too, doesn't, it doesn't yeah. meld together my issue too is that it doesn't I'm not a logic policeman on anything but oh. you start out in one plane of reality where all this incredibly violent slapstick right. leads to no you know ill results and then by the end you're talking you're talking about serious pain and suffering yeah and yet I don't think the film really makes that adjustment for you it's too bad because you know I, I do love the idea of the whole made movie project and, and there's a reason filmmakers keep coming back to it the kids are good and Garth Jennings has some talent but and, not for me and, you know, there's also something about a kid that age uh, falling in love with Rambo maybe not you know that's yeah. not a typical uh, children's movie where I you're think like Cobra this is going to change my life you know, well, Stallone's Cobra that <laughs> maybe not maybe no, not maybe not Later in the show, Robert Downey Jr., Gwyneth Paltrow, and Jeff Bridges lead the star-studded cast of Iron Man. And next, Helen Hunt, Colin Firth, and Matthew Broderick form a love triangle, and then she found me. Anyone else coming? I like music. What kind of music? I like Fleetwood Mac, and, um... I'm very verbal during sex. I'm afraid of drowning. During sex? No, just in general. Oh. Helen Hunt makes her cinematic directorial debut and also has the lead in the consistently mediocre Then She Found Me. It's the kind of film that practically invites you to forget about it about two days after you've seen it. Every Hunt day plays day April. She's a not particularly mother. interesting Welcome school teacher married to the self-centered schlub Ben, played by Matthew Broderick. Given up for adoption as a child, April is shocked to learn her biological mother is Bernice, a New York talk show host played by Bette Midler. Colin Firth shows up in the standard Colin Firth role as the good and noble and conveniently available Frank. He's the single father whose son is a student of April's. Well, bon appetit. Oh, well, would you like to get some dinner? No, I'd rather eat frozen food alone for the 15th month in a row. Yes, I'd like to get dinner. But I think you are a very beautiful woman. And for some reason, I decided not to go on any kind of date for at least a year. Why? Because I'm a f***ing idiot. Adding to the movie of the week tone, just when the school teacher who loves kids never thought she'd have a baby of her own, maybe she will. But maybe the wrong man is the father. I want to try to be with you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry if I didn't instantly come up with a perfect solution to this this very complicated situation. It's not complicated. I'm having this baby. Hunt is just fine in the lead role, and as a director, I guess she's capable, but overall, there's a kind of dull, drab feeling to many of the scenes. These people are dealing with a lot of angst, and that just made me anxious and impatient while watching their struggles. Then She Found Me is like an independent film made for the Lifetime channel, and I do not mean that in a good way. Well, I think if the scenes are dull and drab, I'm not sure how capable she's really showing herself as a director. Well, I mean, there's a, co there's a competency here, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm damning yeah, with very she, faint praise. Right, it's not terrible. But no, it, it's the, not terrible. The only thing that got me through it really was and, and I do not recommend it is, mm. is this is the idea of seeing Bette Midler again I think you can just feel an audience really warming to her yeah. and Colin yeah. Firth too you know that sort of same audience rapport and, and Helen Hunt's relationship to the audience has always been more complicated because mm -hmm. she's kind of edgy and you know a a more of a defensive performer she doesn't let a lot of she's empathy not, or sympathy she's in she's not a warm presence no, no, on screen but she's a smart actress and mm -hmm. I don't think it's translated yet to the kind of decisions you need to make behind the camera also, as her directing herself, she hasn't really figured out how to do that effectively. Yeah, I think it was a curious choice for her first film, the material yeah. itself, kind of downbeat and, like I said, kind of forgettable. Definitely. All right, coming up next, Robert Downey Jr. stars as comic book icon Iron Man. I can fly. And later, Tim Good Allen, job. like you've never seen him before, in Red Belt. I can train people to fight. Dream. Robert Downey Jr. is an unlikely but very effective superhero in John Favreau's Iron Man. This isn't as dark and thrilling as Batman Begins or as supercharged and fun as Spider-Man, but it's a solid, well-made, visually zippy film that could set up an Iron Man franchise.
Iron Man is in theaters now. The crowds are lining up. It's the first big blockbuster of the summer movie season, and I hope the rest of them are as good as this it's one. It's a good one, and here's the here's the thing. I think mm. I overstated the whole idea of it being, you know, a horribly unlikely casting or, you know, a real stretch for Robert Downey Jr. Mm. to play this kind of superhero yeah. franchise mm. character, you know. And But, you know, in retrospect, he's, he's perfect for it. And I think the only thing unlikely about it is that Downey's never been in a movie like this. The billionaire guy he plays, he's perfectly tailored to play this, you know, this brilliant, yeah. interesting, eccentric, conflicted guy. And then the rest of the time, he is in an Iron Man suit, so you don't have right. to be Mr. No, and, Universe right. and you to go play back that to, guy. You go back yeah. to the old Stan Lee comic book, and I mean, the guy's an alcoholic. Yeah. He's this sort of louche playboy who's, you know, trying to find a purpose for his which, life. Which always makes these characters more interesting. Yes, exactly. And and I think, I think even though Favreau is not, I don't think yet, a first-rate action director, mm -hmm. you know, so much of this movie really works because the acting and the smaller scenes, especially yeah. the ones between Downey and Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow, yeah. really pop. Yeah. Favreau might not yet be, you know, let's say Christopher Nolan, who's doing the, the more recent Batman films, but he loves and knows the yeah. comic book characters and the yeah. comic books themselves, and you can feel that coming from And that's a different direction. tone anyway, the Batman yeah. franchise. You know, the asterisk here is it's the first film featuring any scenes uh, with Taliban in them that's going to make probably over $200 million. So. Probably, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Our next movie is Red Belt, and it's the right kind of throwback. In mm. the heyday of film noir, guys like Kirk Douglas and Robert Ryan knew that the boxing ring was the one place a hard luck case could face his demons. In the new film by David Mamet, boxing has been replaced by mixed martial arts. Chiwetel Ejiofor plays Mike Terry, a jiu-jitsu instructor with a studio on L.A.'s west side. All sorts come through his door, including a secretive lawyer played by Emily Mortimer. If you put your arms around me and held me, could I strike you? With your knees. If you turned your body slightly and grasped me, could I strike you from there? Mm. What? No. One night in a bar, the reluctant fighter spots a movie star who gets into a scuffle with a surly bar patron. That's Tim Allen as Chet. Just wanna have a drink. Movie star Chet is making a war film that could really use a dose of realism in the fight sequences, so he figures Mike to be a good prospect for co-producer with all that ready knowledge of his. But you train people to fight. No, I train people to prevail. <laughs> in the street, in the alley, in, in combat, the bodyguard, the cop, the soldier, there's one rule, put the other guy down. Now you have to train in order to do that. Now like a lot of Mammoth's films, Red Belt wobbles in the storytelling and putters right at the climax where you don't want it to slow down. All the same, this one definitely belongs in the top half of Mammoth's resume, and that's what you hope for with any distinctive filmmaker's latest work. Mammoth relishes this world he's writing about, and I was pulled right into it. I like this film. I was too, Michael, and I think the star of any David Mammoth film is, is the script. It's the dialogue, and, and yeah. I think everybody in the cast, including Tim Allen, kind of a surprising, you know, roller playing kind of a Bruce Willis type. Yeah, exactly. star. I think he's pitch perfect. Uh, Edge of Four is a movie star as far as I'm concerned. He's done a lot of different roles and oh. he's always very good in it. And I would agree. I mean, the ending is a little, is a little you know, Karate Kid-esque. But I don't think the story wobbles until then. I think it remains strong and interesting and yeah. surprising the two like most point, of Mammoth's yeah. screenplays throughout. Yeah, I think, I think my issue is this. Anytime Mammoth gets to a scene involving, say, an airport tarmac, as he, <laughs> as he had in Spartan, or, yeah. or I think it was called Heist, Heist, where it just dies. Uh, visually, mm. the film just sort of... Poof, and that's what happens here at this crucial final match where it's just the camera dynamics and the rhythm just there's a lot to, and there's also a lot stiffens. to keep track of with the Ricky Jay character so, and yeah. uh, David Paymer playing the Lone Shark and uh, yeah. Joe Montaigne I mean all these little things going on but I thought all of that actually held up very well yeah. it's a very strong film you, you yeah. know David Mamet martial arts really but you know he can I think no, he no, can no, do no, just sense. about anything and I think it's because it goes back to this sort of film noir use of, of the sport yeah, as, as sort of a reckoning yeah. of the soul you know yeah, a lot yeah, of works okay next is standard operating procedure now this is a film that's sometimes painful to watch, but a movie that must be seen. Oscar-winning documentarian Errol Morris gives us perhaps the definitive examination of the torture scandal at Abu Ghraib, one of the most shameful chapters in modern American military history. Morris shows us the photos we've seen a hundred other times and other pictures I've never seen before. He also recreates some harrowing scenes and conducts interviews with amazingly candid subjects like Lindy England. Everyone tried to tell me, he's too old for you, he's a bad guy. He handed the leash to Lindy. I was blinded by being in love with a man. 
Though you're sickened by the actions of those that were involved, at least some of the members of the 372nd Military Police Company are willing to look Morris in the lens and talk about their crimes. That's more than one can say for the military higher-ups or the administration that either approved the unforgivable un-American torture tactics or looked the other way as the criminal abuse continued. Richard, I cannot quite recommend this film. Really? As much as I think Morris is a first-rate filmmaker, yeah. and his documentary, The Thin Blue Line, which mm -hmm. I think is a masterwork, yeah. uses a lot of these same techniques you see in standard operating procedure. Mm -hmm. Here, I think the filmmaking really suffocates the subject so mm -hmm. that you're really, even, wow. the, even wow. the Abu Ghraib photos themselves, which are the center of this picture, mm -hmm. have a hard time competing and kind of kind of making the impact just because oh, I think know. Morris and the cinematographer just simply soup it up too much. No, it doesn't I, feel completely honest to me. Well, Michael, you know, they are recreating some scenes here, and I do agree that the Danny Elfman score sometimes goes over the uh. top, but it does not, it does not get in the way of the strength of this material and the power of these interviews, especially seeing uh, some of the, you know, and the, some of these now infamous characters actually telling their stories. It doesn't excuse their actions, but I think that's, that's invaluable. And I agree with that, 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 yeah. that a few of the techniques, you know, uh, make this movie not worth seeing, I couldn't disagree well, more. Hold on a minute. Now, as potent as it is to see Lindy England talk about her side of the story, which is really compelling right. stuff, I just feel that the filmmaking is in overdrive every second with visual yeah. graphics and everything yeah. else, and it, I just think this story, which is as urgent as we've got in yeah. current American history, does not completely find itself. I share some of your concerns, but I still think the film is worth seeing. Okay, coming up next in our video segment, what happens when a pop star reaches across the velvet rope and hooks up with a stalkerazzi? No, it's not the Britney Spears story, it's delirious. <laughs> and later, I'll give you my picks for the three best movies in theaters right now. But first, here's a look at what's coming up over the next few weeks. Sounds beefy, Pops. Yeah, I give it a little something extra. I put the quarter in the slot. What's mine is yours, baby, remember? that was closer. This week's video segment is brought to you by Raisinets. Make a deliciously smart choice with Raisinets. It won't last. I'm not going anywhere. Looking at movies new on DVD, I liked Hilary Swank and P.S. I Love You, but I cannot overstate my disdain for Over Her Dead Body or The Hottie and The Naughty. They may rhyme, but they both suck. Now, the film I'm picking, though, this week, Michael, is Delirious, a movie that hardly anybody saw, but I really enjoy this film. Uh, Steve Buscemi in a great performance as a low-level paparazzi. Even in the paparazzi pecking order, he's kind of at the bottom rung there, and, you know, to his knees in the sewer. Uh, and Michael Pitt is this young homeless guy he takes in and they have this obsession with a Britney Spears type starlet. Delirious is written and directed by Tom DiCillo who's made uh, Living in Oblivion and several other interesting films and uh, down at the Ebert Fest recently in beautiful Champaign-Urbana this film played to a, a rousing ovation from a packed house at the Virginia Theater and DiCillo and I talked about the movie afterwards. I, I think it was a very rewarding experience for him to see how much an audience really enjoyed this film if they had the chance to see it. Well now it's on DVD. Yeah, there you go. I was down at Ebert Fest a couple days after you were and I had a chance to talk to Bill Forsyth the Scottish director, and it is a pleasure to go to that festival. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> My video pick is I'm Not There, which won Kate Blanchett an Oscar nomination, one of two last year, for her sly portrait of Bob Dylan. The writer-director Todd Haynes uses a half dozen actors to dramatize different aspects of one cat-like personality. The best scenes in this film belong to Blanchett and to Heath Ledger as a young man playing a Dylan-type character in a 1960s movie. Some legends are made after death, sadly. Some, like Dylan, keep reinventing themselves across a happily long life. I'm so glad you mentioned uh, Heath Ledger's performance. He's very strong in this film. I know he has two other movies coming out, including, of course, the Batman film where he plays the Joker, mm. but this is very, very strong work as well. Excellent. Okay, so both I'm Not There and Delirious will be in stores on Tuesday. Check them out. And we'll be back with my picks for three to see, the best three movies in theaters right after this. Closed captioning for Ebert and Roper is sponsored by... Use the movie ticket stock card. It's fast, easy, and painless. And now, three to see. My three favorites currently in theaters. Number three, Red Belt. David Mamet's pungent tale of loyalty and deceit in the world of mixed martial arts. Number two, Young at Heart, a joyous story of the power of music. And number one, like a rocket, Iron Man proof that not all superhero blockbusters have to weigh 10 tons. This one's quick-witted and a lot of fun thanks to Robert Downey Jr. and Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah, it's a big hit. I like all your picks. Very good. Thank and you. And if you have a pungent tail, you should see a doctor. <laughs> okay, that's it for this week. Until next week, the balcony is closed.
It's Tour de French Toast at IHOP. Four of our famously phenomenal French toasts, top, swirled, and stuffed with goodness. IHOP. Come hungry, leave happy. TV Guide Sexiest Stars Issue. <laughs> Come and get it. What's in here is what's in here. Real peaches, fresh cream, Briars all natural. Extraordinary taste. Net Zero gives you the fastest surfing available over dial-up and virus protection starting at $9.95. Try it risk-free for 30 days with our money-back guarantee. It might seem strange, but your antenna TV could become just a box if you don't get this box. In February 2009, some TVs will stop working unless they're upgraded to digital television with this DTV converter box. Without this upgrade, your antenna TV will not work. Make sure your TV is DTV. Call 888-DTV-2009 or visit DTVAnswers.com. Don't let your TV become just a box.